you think if you think God's faithfulness is not great, let me see your hands up. I put my hands down. <laughs> but if you think truly from the bottom of your heart that God's faithfulness is great, let me see your hands up. Put hands. Because his faithfulness is great. Amen. Happy Sabbath, God's people. Happy Sabbath. Are you happy, church? Yes. So happy Sabbath, God's people. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. You know, God is good. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Today, I'm at our church, our very lovely and beloved Seventh-day Adventist Church, Amen. the chosen people, mm -hmm. the, special people. the special people, the people who are called to deliver the message of the free angels, Amen. the remnant. Mm -hmm. It's important for us to know that we are the remnant. Because, you know, that remnant, nobody wants it. <coughs> Everyone's had a feel, and they let the remnant there. And God says that's what you are. You are the remnant, the few ones. The ones that could not be consumed. Not because they're not good enough, but because they just left it there. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, and I stand before you, our God. I stand before you, I stand before your throne to deliver your message to your children. This altar, this pulpit, you have given me at this time to be your messenger and deliver your message. So I can only invite the presence of your Holy Spirit to be with you at this time and to be with your children as I deliver this message in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 This message I have titled Between Law, Grace and Faith. There's something happening. The law, grace, and faith, something is happening. The Bible packages those three things. The law, then the grace, then the faith. And in all of this, we as students of God, we are relevant. And the things that we do and our understanding of these goes a long way in fostering our relationship with God. In pleasing God as our Father, our understanding of the law, God's grace, and the faith that we profess. They go a long way in fostering our own relationship with God. If you don't understand them, then you will not understand God. If you don't understand the purpose of the laws of God, then you will not know who God is. If you don't understand what God's grace means, then you will not understand your maker. If you don't understand what your faith represents, then you cannot have any relationship with me. It's difficult, very, very difficult, to say I have a relationship with God and don't understand what God's laws are, what God's grace means, and what does my faith mean. Because in God's law you will discover God. In God's law you will do what? You will discover who God is. In God's grace, you will understand God's action and God's purpose. In your faith, you will understand who you are. 
in your faith. So, we're looking at the law, grace, and what? Faith. And faith. You know, Apostle Paul said, now abide at what? Faith. And it says the greatest of them is? Love. It's love. So it says, now abide it, faith and love. It says the greatest of them is love. But today, I'm not making the same analysis when it comes to love, grace, and faith. When I stay before the throne of God that I stand, I don't even know which of them is greater. I don't, but the Father does. And in the course of a sermon, the truth will be revealed to us. I have decided to make it that way with my maker. You see, I am planning, I'm building an online school. And I'm preparing lectures for my online students. And I've been thinking what's the best strategy to use. Do I go make all the researches and then teach like I am perfect? Do I just do it and then the students can see my errors? When I make mistakes, I say to them, you see, when you're programming on a computer, that's actually how you make mistakes. And it's when you make these mistakes that you can, then can correct yourself and they can, you know, and then go back because there is no person who programs a computer today. There is no person who developed any kind of computer programs today that started being perfect. No matter how good you are today, you make mistakes. And no matter how good you are today, you make mistakes. You don't close the tab correctly, the computer will give you an error. Flag the error, you go, and then you check the code line by line, and then you find the line where the problem is, then you fix it when you run the code again, the compiler compiles it, and it gives you the correct message and the correct output. So I said to God, you know, I'm just going to take that approach today. I want us as a church to together look at all of this and then agree that this, this, this is the big one. But we're not going to downplay or downgrade anyone. So let's read scripture. Mm. Quickly. Mm. When do I have till Elder Kundomiso? Um, <laughs> yeah, go on. Okay. Me. okay. You see, uh, at least the other day, the, uh, the preacher came to me and he wasn't very pleased. Why wasn't he pleased? He wasn't pleased, he said it was the first time in his 18 years of being a pastor that he was told that that was given time, you got 10 minutes left. He's an American preacher. So after the, after the, after the sermon, after church, I went to him and to apologize on behalf of the church, of this church as a pastor. You know, I'm so sorry you felt that way, but we are in the United Kingdom and it's a conservative country. <laughs> we check everything, we use time, we time everything here. He said, okay, okay, but they should have told me, you know, I should, they should have made me aware of this, you know, they should have told me. But it's so important that in the United Kingdom, we have to check what time we've got. So now I know. Now, Romans, uh, I mean Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you cannot take credit for this. It is a gift from God. So, verse 9 on says, Salvation, salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. And none of us can boast about it. I'm reading the New Living Translation of the Bible. That's a text in... King James Version reads this, reads thoughts. For by grace are ye saved through faith. Most people know that. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Mm. 
And not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, I prayed to someone last week, last Sunday, and I've got to record it, even the church also recorded it. And if people don't understand what I was saying last week, it was seem as though I was asking people to boast about the salvation. Because I said, in John 3, 16, God says, the Bible tells us, God tells us that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So which means that the person that believes in him will be saved. But if you don't believe, you don't get saved. So you did something, didn't you? Did you do anything? You did something. What did you do? Believe. You believed. You believed. So, God drops the Bible there, or the hymnal over there, or drops the shirt over there, and it says, you know, it's the person who sits on it that gets the comfort of sitting on the chair. And you stood there. You've got to move over. You've got to shift yourself. You've got to sit on the chair. Otherwise, you do not enjoy the comfort of sitting on the chair, would you? So you make that effort. You make that move. You believe. And I said to them, like, like I'm saying again today, that even though you believe, but the Bible also tells us that God helps us. God prepares our heart. We do evangelism, don't we? And each time we pray for evangelism, when we're going out to evangelism, we pray that God will prepare the heart yes. of the people who knock on their doors so that they will be receptive to our message. If God does not prepare the heart, the person will not be receptive. So the day that somebody preached to you about Christ Jesus, God has already done the work. Either you were born in a Christian home or somebody knocked on your door, your heart has already been prepared. You have been prepared to be special. You have been chosen to be the special person with a special relationship with God. Either by the incident of your birth, either by the programming of your heart, preparing it for the message of salvation. God, you know, it, it is the God that will say, I present to you life and death, but choose life that you may live. It brings the option, but it prepares you for it. You could still resist it, but it prepares you for it. And because you have refused to resist it, you have become saved. So that's why the Bible makes it clear to us, say, for by grace are you saved through faith. So God makes it, he makes us know that our faith is important in this transaction. It makes us understand what? That our faith is important in this transaction. We've got to exhibit faith. We've got to manifest it. We've got to live by it. He said we live by faith and not by sight. We've got to live by it. Because we're ready to live by faith, we take actions that ordinarily we wouldn't have taken. We take actions that we wouldn't ordinarily have taken. So you will go and enroll on LPC, knowing that you will pass your LPC. Why? Because you are exercising faith. You are exercising faith in God. That God will see me through. It is that faith with which we do a lot of things. But the most important of all the faith is the one that we manifest in the heart. That we profess in the Father. So that 
we do something. But God says, don't take credit for it. Don't take credit for it. Do not take credit for it. You're saved by faith, by grace through faith, but don't take credit for it. Okay, we'll come back to that. But I just want, I just want us to read Hebrew 10, 38. Let somebody open it and read it. Thirty-eight. And now the just shall live by faith, but if a man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Any man, sorry. Then now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in it. Okay, let somebody else read Galatians 3 11. In this world. 
and I'm not telling you this just to just to persuade, just to uh, make your heart feel good, which of course <coughs> I must do. It's my calling as a child of God to one another. But I'm telling you because it is the truth. It is the truth. God tells us that when we meet Him face to face, a lot of things will be revealed to us. That's what the Bible teaches us. That's the instructions of God to us. Because many things that's happening today, people ask that and say, if this, if there's God, why would this happen? If there's God, why would that happen? So they don't make sense to us. But God promises us that at the end of time, when we meet God, then all of these things will then make sense to us. But there's nothing as a Christian that you present before God that He doesn't clarify to you. That you don't make sense of and say, ah, okay, that was why it happened. <coughs> so the faith that we profess in God, our faith gives us life. God's grace, God's grace, God's grace is who? God's grace is personified. Does anybody know what personification means? Given a human quality. Yes, given human to an abstract thing. God's grace is personified in who? In Jesus Christ. Jesus is God's grace personified. The gift of His Son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So God personifies his grace. That gift that none should boast of, that is not of work, that gift is Jesus Christ himself. Amen. So it comes in the form of man, God in person, God in flesh, died for humanity on the cross died for everyone on the cross at Calvary, resurrected on the third day, ascended unto heaven, sits today on the right hand of the throne of God in heaven. We exercise faith. That's our belief in Him. Faith is such a big concept Amen. that you can apply it in different situations. Somebody who doesn't have money and got admission to come and study law. I'm talking about myself. In 2006, I didn't have a penny, but I had an admission letter in my hand to come and study law at BPP Law School, a private law school. And the law school says, you can accept this offer with 50 pounds. Just an acceptance. Because that is law. I didn't know that because I haven't studied law. But that is law. Even you can accept a deal of a million pounds by paying just one pound. That one pound that you pay now forms a contract. Yes. Now you can then pay the balance any other time, but you have established a contract with just one pound. That's why when, when you speak to your, to your creditor on the phone, and they say, well, how much can you afford to pay? Do you know what they're trying to do? This is law talk now. Do you know what they're trying to do? Even if you're owing them £10,000, the moment you pay £10 out of that £10,000, you have admitted to owing them. The contract. So that's why they always tell you, it's not about how much, just pay some, anything you can pay today. Because they want you to commit to owing them. But if you don't pay any money, you can come tomorrow and say, I'm disputing this debt. And in order to say, I'm disputing this debt, they cannot chase you anymore. Because it's no longer a debt. It's a case now. A dispute is going on. Which can result in court. Which can take time to resolve. But the moment you commit a, a dime, you have formed the contract, you have admitted guilt. And you owe then, you cannot come back tomorrow. No, I'm not paying. The court's just going to ask you and say, then why did you? Why did you pay that thing? Guilty. So, and I 
was saying yeah, last week actually, I was saying how God is the best lawyer that I know. Every time I read the Bible, I see God having a deal with thoughts. It's always dealing. It's always dealing. That, that, that Bible, that Bible is a book of the law, as, as it's described. It's a book of the law. In it are all sorts of contracts. They are called covenant. Huh? You don't study covenant in your law degree until you do the LPC. Then you will then see that what you used to study in land law, then when you're studying it on the LPC at law school, then it becomes covenant. Yes. Then you begin to see the restrictive covenant and the and the other sorts of covenants in land law is such a complex thing. But when you read the Bible, were you not when you were when you were studying your LPC and studying land law, were you not constantly coming back to the Bible? That was my case when I was studying law. Each time they talk about covenants, it's always taking back to I need to take him back to the Bible and say, This is what God wrote in the Bible. I'm making a covenant with you. Amen. Covenant simply means contract. But God has used that technical term, that advanced term, is used it for us in the Bible. So, so that most times we are dealing with God. And when He says that our salvation comes by our believing, is such a dealing. And says, when you believe, when you give me your faith, I will give you my son. Why am I giving you my son? Why am I giving you my son? Why am I throwing away my love and giving you my son instead? Why? Did God say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Because remember, we are looking at the law, God's grace, and our faith. And you see where I started? I started by discussing the faith that we profess. And then I come to the grace that God, with which God has saved us. Now we are looking at the law. The law. The law was there. But God brought his son. He gave us Jesus Christ. And said, no man shall be justified by the works of the law. But by faith in Christ Jesus Christ. Yet, I came here today as a Seventh-day Adventist, a proud one, to keep God's law. And sometimes, that might make me sound like a fool. Because I stand here to tell you, the law cannot save, and yet I take the time to keep that law that I know cannot save me. Many things in Christianity sound foolish. Like I was saying to the church last week, I said, even believing that God will save you sounds foolish and stupid. To believe that a man died, that God sent his son from heaven. Have you discussed that with your friend and they make you feel stupid? Those atheists? They don't believe it. That God came down from heaven to save you, they ask you to save you from what? And you sit there and look at them. I said, why can't they get it? <laughs> Jesus Christ. What is this? You, you, you sound like a fool. Admit it. The Bible says a fool says in his heart that there is no God. But many times I said to God, I sound more like a fool believing in you. Do you know if it makes sense this person will be filled today? Really if it makes sense, mm -hmm. this place will be filled today. Mm -hmm. It's because it's so stupid. Admit it. Admit it. You've got to admit it as a Christian that you sound stupid to the unbelievers. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then they made provision of law 
and then the provision of grace, and then it says you must exercise faith. And every time I look up to heaven, I say, Jehovah, my father, why do you make me sound like a fool? <laughs> That's why I say that faith is the small thing. The faith is the small thing. But I'm not asking you to boast about it. But I'm asking you to treasure it. I'm asking you to do what? To treasure that faith that you have in God. That you believe that He sent His Son from heaven, that came down to represent His Father, and that He died for your sins, and that on the third day He resurrected from the dead, and then he stayed on earth again for another 40 days and then ascended unto heaven and now sits at the right hand of the throne of the majesty of God the Father and makes intercessions for you and I. Because the law was there but the law was burdensome. The law was what? Burdensome. Do you know if you called me a stupid man that that would cost you a run in the time of the law? Do you know that? Okay. Otherwise, the sins won't be forgiven you. Until you get the run and then you have to go to the temple and kill that run. And spill the blood. And then you've atoned for your sins. Because you called your brother a fool. But on your way home. <laughs> on your way home. You thought about your sister. And you said what kind of idiot is she? Inside of your heart. Why would she do such a stupid thing? Inside of your heart, you've not arrived home from the temple, but you have seen the game. So you have to go and get another run. I run back to the temple and said, You know what? In my heart, I sinned against my sister. I called her a fool in my heart. And that is a sin against God. Please slaughter this run for me because I want to be at peace with God. But as the priest slaughtered the ram and spilled the blood and make atonement for your sins, you were living there and going home and you were thinking of your friend who borrowed some money from you and hasn't paid back. And you say, what kind of an idiot is that friend? <laughs> and then you remembered that that is a sin against God. And then you have to run down and get a ram. And then you run back to the priest. And he's a priest, I have sinned against my brother, a ram now. Please slaughter and spill the blood so that I can be at peace with my God and on your way home. You remember the son that you sent to wash the dishes in the morning and they refused and you said today it is me and him. Then you remember that that is a sin to say today it is me and my son and then you have to go back to the priest and on your way back home you remember your mother. What did mama say to you yesterday? She said some word that you didn't like and you said to mama that kind of mother said why? You run. Ah. And I said, they cannot be living like that. Yes. Amen. They cannot be living like that. I think I preached the sermon before. And I said, the children of Israel didn't even know that they needed Jesus. But God knew that they needed him. God knew that the bondage of the law was too much to make it. What will save man? You see why I keep the Sabbath? Because God did not say the bondage of the law is too 
us to keep. God knows we can keep the law. But God knows that the bondage of the law is too much to keep to save man. Amen. That's why the Bible tells us no man can be justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ Jesus. Because the law is not bad. The Bible makes it clear in the book of Romans chapter 8. It says, is the law therefore sin? What did the Bible tell us? Is this God forbid? The laws are good because they demonstrate a relationship between father and son. It's only the one that is your father that can tell you what I just told you, my son, today. Amen. I took you outside and gave you some lashing with my mouth, didn't I? <laughs> and I could do that because I'm your dad. If I wasn't your dad, I wouldn't even notice it, would I? That's why when we grew up in our culture, you know, when somebody comes and corrects your son, you don't grow angry with them, you actually appreciate them. You get to know somebody who cares that will see that your son is doing something wrong. I won't wait until the father comes of God and say, boy, you shouldn't be doing anything like that. And we've always told our children when someone corrects you, don't you ever tell them that that's none of your business. Because I get that a lot. When I see a young boy smoking out, I always point to them. I've kind of stopped it now. But I would go to them and say, why are you smoking? You're too young to smoke. And they'll say, go mind your business. <laughs> Man. You know. But you're too young to you, you shouldn't be doing it. You know that there's no health benefit and there's nothing you gain from doing this thing as a group in the business. But I think, you know. So better I've always told my kids, if you're doing something wrong and somebody comes and tells you off, don't you ever tell them to go mind their business. Because it's because they care. That makes them to notice and come to you. Just take correction. And change from it. So the law is not sin, it can never be sin. But the law cannot save anybody. It wasn't the purpose. Thank you, Because you would not know sin except the law says. The law forbids you from doing some things that are wrong. Then when you sin, you know you have sinned. And then you can come to God for forgiveness. And the law was doing that. It was doing that. But the burden of it was too much. And the people didn't get it. That they are not getting salvation from doing this thing. And it's not making them to be a better friend of God. For killing all the lambs, that the high priest had to atone for his own sin. A sinful high priest, how could he take away your own sin? But the law is not bad. Listen, if you are not a Seventh Adventist and you are watching this video, the laws of God are not bad for you. God gave the Ten Commandments as instructions to us as a form of relationship with Him. In fact, the Sabbath law, God tells us repeatedly in the Bible that they are a sign that He is our God and we are His children. That's why all seven Adventist people, that is why we keep the Sabbath law. Because it's a demonstration of our relationship with God. That we belong to Him. That we are His children. And you can join us. You can join us. 
You can go look for a Seventh Adventist church and find out more. Join us. Come join us. Come learn more about the laws of God. Come learn that we Seventh Adventists, us Seventh Adventists, that we don't believe that the law saves. We do not keep the law of God because we believe that's what saves us. No, we are saved by grace through faith. Amen. We are saved by grace through faith. It is what the Bible teaches us. It is what we believe. It is what we uphold. But we have never believed one day that the laws that God gave us on how to conduct ourselves as a sign of relationship with Him, we have never believed one day that it is wrong. Church, have you ever believed that? No. Interestingly, interestingly, the Bible itself, from Genesis to Revelation, never told us that the Lord is wrong. The Bible never told us that the laws are wrong. The Bible teaches us, like if you are a Christian you will know, that the Lord does not save us. But the Bible never asks us anywhere to throw God's law in the garbage bin. <laughs> no. No. God never told us to throw his laws in the garbage bin. Such your Bible. From Genesis to Revelation. My name is Bernard Jenipuri and you'll find my phone number on the screen. And get in touch. My phone number, my email. If you find any scripture, it's a challenge. If you find any scripture where God says, ignore my laws, throw them in the garbage bin, they are no, no, they are no longer relevant, you can live as you like and disregard my laws, then please get in touch. Okay. I would like to discuss that with you. But if you searched your Bible and you didn't find any such, please go to the next, the nearest Seven Adventist church to you. Ask for the pastor, ask for the elders there, and come in and learn more about the Seven Adventist faith. Because we do all we we'll do. We do everything that we do because of our love for God. We do everything that we do because of our love for Jesus. We do everything that we do because just like you seeking the truth, we sought the truth. And we found the truth of God in His Holy Spirit. Nowhere else but in the Holy Bible. Amen. The truth of God is revealed in his words. Church, God's law, God's grace, and the faith that we profess. The message that I hear from the Father here is that we cannot say one is more important than the other. Why is that? Because one leads to the other. And each one makes the other complete. Without the law, the grace of God will not be appreciated. And without God's grace, and without our faith, Without God's grace, there can be no salvation. And without our faith, there can be no salvation. It doesn't take away the sovereignty of God. But according to the Holy Bible, our salvation came to us by grace through faith. Amen. We must carry that message forward as serving that dentist. Yes. We must be proud of it. We must tell the world. I think it's our calling. I believe strongly that that's our calling. To be able to know that we are special before God. That's what the law gives. 
it establishes that special relationship. You cannot claim to know God and ignore Islam. Yes. And though his laws don't save us, we are saved by his grace, which is personified in Christ Jesus. The Bible tells us very clearly in John 1.17 that the law came through who? Through Moses, but grace came through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is grace personified. And without our faith, we will not speak that salvation that God has provided us. So we just thank God that He's made all this provision possible for us. Mm -hmm. And that He will stay with us and be with us till the end of time. Amen. As He has promised us. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Thou who is the Lord, we will pray, O oh God, that You will continually speak with us and help us to grow in faith, help us to be a more mature Christian, help us to show Your love and to manifest Your grace in our lives. Thank You, O oh Father. What in heaven? For we have prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.